Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is the Casual Friday Podcast. Once in a very great while, I do an interview on Casual Friday. I interviewed independent dyer Margaret Long of LGF Surrey's a number of years ago at her dye studio. She has an amazing setup and it was really cool to get that behind the scenes view of what an independent dyer does. And just a couple of years ago, I did an interview with Wendy Peterson, the creator of the website yarnsub.com, where you can get information that will help you make an informed decision on yarn substitutions. Again, it was a behind the scenes look at work that is done on behalf of knitters that most of us don't think about as being the work of a single person or just don't think of it as being work at all. Today, I'll be interviewing Sarah Walworth and Christina McGrath. They are knitting technical editors. They have a YouTube podcast called Tech Tip Talk where they interview people in the fiber and textile industry about topics like the technical side of design, size inclusivity, the joy of design, and many other topics. They're also the authors of a brand new book, The Knitting Pattern Writing Handbook. It's aimed at independent designers who want to publish their knitting designs and focuses on the kinds of information that should be included in a good pattern, as well as resources for how to do things like grading patterns, which is that process of sizing a pattern up and down from the original size that you designed in order to accommodate different sizes, as well as the all important task of hiring a technical editor. So if your experience with knitting patterns is strictly from the knitting side by following instructions in order to replicate what is promised in the pattern photos, you might not be aware of what it is that tech editors do or even that they exist at all. So I wanted to bring them on the channel to give knitters a bit of that behind the scenes look at what technical editors do and why they're so important to all of us who knit from patterns. I started the interview by asking each of them to give their origin stories, how and when they learned to knit, and then how they came to be knitting technical editors. So let's go to the interview. I started knitting as a child. I was taught by my mother. I was taught to knit and crochet at the same time, and I didn't like knitting. I actually ended up crocheting um, until I was an adult. Then as an adult, I had a time period where I needed something to do with my hands. I was homeschooling my children and I needed something to do while they were working on their lessons. And so this was in the early aughts and I went to, there were people were actually posting videos and blog posts about like the different knitting techniques. And I retaught myself how to knit from videos online, which was like a big deal yeah. in 2006. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I started to apply all the things that I knew about garment construction because I did a lot of uh, alterations and things like that for friends and family. And I made my own clothes. So then I started to dive into, well, how do you do this in knitting? And that led to remaking a lot of patterns and just getting into deeply into knitting and knitting patterns. Then I found out that there is something called technical editing for knitting. I was already working to be a copy editor and I had no idea that you could edit knitting patterns in the same way that a copy editor edits, um, edits a fiction book or a, a medical paper. And boy, I jumped in and I never looked back. Um, I began my business in 2016 and I just, I've edited many patterns and I just love helping designers and publications make patterns great for the maker. So that's how I got started. I have my family, like my, you know, grandmothers and great grandmothers, aunts on both sides were very accomplished, like sewists and knitters and crocheters. And I was never interested. Like I just not someone who likes crafts or anything like that. And, um, my grandmother tried to teach me to crochet when I was a kid and I couldn't figure it out. Like I just didn't have that kind of interest or thinking. And, um, uh, I, uh, studied yoga as an adult and I, for a really long time, had a strong practice and learned about knitting that way and ended up taking a class when my firstborn was like two 
And just at a, like a nightlife class at a high school. Cause I was like, what's this knitting? Like, what is this? You know, it's talking about how it's meditative and all these things. It's the new well, yoga. The new yoga. That's what it said. Knitting <laughs> is the new said. yoga. And then like in my yoga journal magazine in like 2000 and whatever, six or something. Um, and I, so I took a class at like a nightlife class at the high school and, um, I was just hooked. I mean, that night after the class, I like went to like what store is open. I think it was like, you know, AC Moore or something and like bought whatever, you know, I didn't even care. Just and started another thing that she had taught us and just became super obsessed. You know, um, I just really loved it. And um, yes, fast forward to like all these, like a decade later and or more. And I, was trying to find a way to work from home, um, to be with my kids. And, um, I needed to work part-time. I couldn't work full-time. So I wanted something I could do at home. And I was really striking out. There really wasn't, I wasn't finding anything I could do. And I came across this, um, tech editing course. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I have really strong skills when it comes to things like that, but I didn't really have a great way, uh, working from home to apply them. And I, you know, also like have a lot of experience working with patterns. And I was like, you, this like made for me, like, I can't even believe this is like, I just, yeah. So I just, I did, um, what I had to do to learn, not just to tech edit patterns, but to, you know, own a business and what I would need to do to make, to do that from home and make that work. So I was, that's, yeah, I was, it was a really good fit. And I really just, I loved tech editing. I love tech editing. So. Yeah. I have a degree in writing and I worked as a tech editor, uh, a technical writer for a while. And I think that writing knitting patterns is the most difficult writing yes. I yes. have ever done. I really think it's the hardest. Um, it's way harder than writing computer user manuals or writing fiction or right. It's just so, it's so hard. Um, so I want to, uh, hear your thoughts on why tech editors are important to both designers, but also to the knitters who use those patterns. They're important because uh, you know this, how many times have you sent an email and then you go back and you read it and there's errors in yeah. it. There's like a typo or something like that. When you're dealing with technical writing and like you said, Knitting patterns are like the ultimate of technical writing where we're translating what we're doing with our hands into abbreviations and coded language. And it's it's a particular type of language that you have to learn carefully. And there can be, you know, you have one abbreviation that's off or one space that's off or one punctuation in the wrong place and that confuses the maker or makes things incorrect. So a technical editor is usually trained to go systematically through a pattern and a designer or even an editor that's overseeing a bunch of patterns may have seen this pattern for months, like over and over again. And we get blind to our own mistakes. Mm -hmm. We We don't see them after a while. And so that's where a second set of eyes can come in. And an editor who is trained in technical editing will will know exactly what to look for and how to polish things in a way that makes it great for the maker. And that's the key there. I know, Christina, you could probably take this this point, is we work as technical editors from the seat of the knitter. We don't work as, we work on behalf of the designer, but we really take the stance that we're working from the perspective of the maker. How to make a good experience, how to make the knitter be successful and have a nice time of it. Like, it's like you said, it's a complicated thing to do to translate what you're doing with your hands on to instructions on paper and words and numbers. And so if there is a mistake, it can, it's just, if if there's any confusion and it's easy for it to be confusing you when, you're, when you're writing this kind of way, like you said, it's very easy for it to be confusing. And, um, So a tech editor who is used to really comfortable working with patterns and has seen a lot of patterns and really comfortable with that, with that kind of language can help you have it not be confusing. And the better that the pattern is, and those confusions get eliminated, 
means the knitter is going to have a successful time. If the knitter is frustrated and struggling with all these confusions and errors in a pattern or things that they're not sure of, or aren't sure what's supposed to happen, it's, they're not going to have success with the pattern and they're not going to want to do it. You know, and they're not going to trust the designer. They're not, they're, they're going to be unhappy. And they're in my own experience with some of my friends who are in the hand knitters guild here in Dallas is they're like, how do I fix this? The designer made so many mistakes and they get frustrated and then they don't ever want to knit from that designer again. Well, they what happens? I think if that happens too much, you mm -hmm. know, uh, knitters can really lose faith in, 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 and get just frustrated and kind of like have a negativity about patterns. about, about patterns. And if you have a pattern that they can rely on and gets them what you've promised them in a way that is easy to understand for them and they can follow it in a, in a, in a nice way that that's going to, that really does establish trust. And it makes them like, Oh, you know, who thankfully, you know, because there are a lot of bad patterns and we've all knit from them and it's very frustrating. And if you have a pattern, if you've created a pattern that the makers trust, have a great experience with, guess what? They become your super fans. Mm. I, I have friends who buy every pattern from certain designers because they love the designer and they love what the designer is doing and they trust the designer. How many times have we come into the first time we're working a pattern and always in the back of our mind, we're like, I don't know. I don't know if I trust this or could, this could be a mistake. We're always kind of on edge and it's great to just relax into the experience of knitting. So it sounds like both of you, you know, have your knitting journey is within the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's really when the internet started to affect knitting in so many different ways, both, you know, have the ability for knitters to contact each other and become exposed to, to other things. What do you think that have been the biggest changes in knitting patterns in this period of the internet compared to only the era of like when patterns were, you know, published on paper? Um, what do you see as the biggest changes? Length and teaching that happens in a pattern. I think there's a lot less that is left up to the knitter and a lot more help that is given to the knitter. I think, um, it's not like a little tiny paragraph in a magazine is the whole sweater. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, um, it's much more, um, fleshed out. I also think that there's a lot more, um, things added on to the pattern, like extensive charting, um, like written instructions for the charts, tutorials, uh, tutorials, sch detailed schematics more because of the extensiveness that a, every knitting pattern now can be a little mini ebook if it's right. provided digitally and sizing patterns, guidance, sizing guidance, uh, modifications, pictures. This does put a lot onto the designer or the publisher because then you feel like you might have to provide all this extra information. So it's, that can be a little tricky, but I think that's the big change that has happened is that there's a lot more handholding um, from the designer's aspect to assist the maker in creating this. And there's a lot less assumed knowledge. Um, in other words, we wouldn't like, sometimes we can refer to other like YouTube videos or things mm -hmm. like that as tutorials. But I think we see in the patterns, there's a lot more helpful information than there used to be, say, 20 years ago in a book that you would pull off a shelf. Well, so, so knitting patterns kind of stand alone now. Like they they can, it's all you need. So many knitting patterns is all you need to knit that project is this pattern. Where it didn't used to be that way, you would need other guidance or other knowledge. Well, like Sarah said, you don't assume knowledge in knitting patterns. Um, you, the designer who gives the knitter that information in the, in the pattern. And I think we've talked, we talk about this in the book a little bit that the, it's so different because it does not have to be restricted by how many pages are allowed in a book or a magazine, you know, digital downloads for patterns can be as big as, as many pages as, um, as they want. Is there a downside to that though, to have oh, a yeah. hundred percent? Oh yeah. 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 We, you know, we say that this is how it is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we agree with that pattern should be this way. Yeah. It should be handholding. Um, I think there is, there should be some 
element of this that it's maybe too much and maybe gone too far into this and we need to swing back a little bit into allowing knitters to have some agency for their knowledge and for their work. Like if you say cast on a certain number with a stretchy cast on or whatever, allowing them to figure out, okay, what is that? And what does that mean? Instead of dictating how it should be done. The only thing that I think is, is why I think one of the bigger reasons that this is sticking around all this teaching and patterns is because the way knitters are learning to knit, the way people are learning to knit and coming to this craft is very different. It's not all personal like this. It's, you know, a lot of it's done online mm -hmm. and learning from watching videos. So when you don't have guidance from somebody or know what books to buy or anything like that, you're really relying on the information and the pattern to teach you things you wouldn't even know to ask about or learn about, you know? Um, I think what's negative about it is that it is overwhelming to the designer and to yes. the knitter and to the tech editor, you know? I mean, it's a lot more work and a lot more onus put on the designer um, and a lot more responsibility and it's a, it can be overwhelming to the knitter where they have more information. They have more choices in modifications. They have, you know, more um, help to follow the pattern, but it also can be like, whoa, this is a lot of pages and whoa, you know. Yeah. And it's a lot if you don't need that. It's, exactly. It can be frustrating to knitters who do have experience. I recently, like, I didn't want to design my own headband. I just wanted to, I found something and it was a 10 page pattern for a little rectangle. <laughs> and it's because they had the written instructions and the charted instructions and, you know, and it was good, but I could knit the whole thing from the chart, but it was just like, we, you know, it was like so much to wade through. And I do like, printing it out so then I'm like which pages do I need to print you know so so yeah it's like it has really swung like like you said to an ebook and I'm like do we really need an ebook for everything we need well, I think it I think it depends and I think that's where you know our our point of view in um in in this is thinking about the knitter who doesn't have that experience because I can say that new newer knitters even knitters who maybe have been knitting for a while, but don't have a ton of experience, um, really don't know and are really lost by, um, these like short form, just to chart paragraph, like don't know what to do. And it gets yeah. really, it's like frustrating. You want to do the thing, but you're like, you can't decode. You don't know all that stuff. And I think that because of the way the changes and how people are learning and how things are, it you, you you almost it almost forces you to approach um pattern writing for the as if it's someone who doesn't know right so this is an important aspect that the designer needs to decide for themselves who mm -hmm. who's my mm -hmm. audience is my, my audience, audience? Beginner, who am i writing for who am i writing for who are my patterns aimed at if i'm designing complex garments it's not going to be for beginner knitter and actually then you can have assumed knowledge yeah um, and I think that this is key for branding. When the mm -hmm. designer makes a decision about who my audience is, who am I writing for, then that allows them to hone who they're actually um, addressing their marketing to mm -hmm. and who they're cultivating as an audience. And then that allows the designer a lot of leeway to produce the patterns that work best for them and doesn't cause them to overwork or have exorbitant text editing costs because they're producing 30 page eBooks. Right. What else is the designer like doing as, as work? How else can they um, support and offer that information to their audience without having to pack all this stuff into a pattern? Like, mm -hmm. are there other ways they can support their knitters that isn't just having it all packed into, into patterns. Do you, and do you think the onus on all of this instruction has really been pushed onto the independent designers as opposed to the established larger companies who maybe are still producing, you know, little, mm -hmm. little patterns like <laughs> or this? Books or magazines? I think so, because I think the independent designers see a gap in the market. This is a way for them to get their products purchased, is to provide a lot of information, to be helpful. Um, and I think that's allowed uh, over the, the last decade, at least, for designers to kind of have a leg up over some of the other publications and to get to, to actually earn some income from their, from their products. I do you want to say, I think a lot of this 
these um this these inclusions and these changes have been shaped and informed by the kind of um inquiries and um customer service situations that designers have received like i think that's in, that informs a lot of what gets included is what designers get asked and told by their by their audience or people out there and they're taking in all that information well, it's a more direct relationship between the knitter and the designer, as opposed to writing to the contact information of a magazine, and then it gets passed around and who's going to answer it and how does that uh, change anything? I mean, yeah, making everything a personal relationship is super different. Super. Yeah. And it's, and it's a, it, it's a burden really also, yeah. I think on the independent designer. One of the things I noticed is like, when Ravelry started back in, I think it was like 2007, shortly after that, that was when I, I really see is when the independent designer was able to do things. Because before that, you had to try to set up a shopping cart on your own website. And it was like, you know, it was, it was such a hassle. And so that really brought this rise of the independent designer, but now we have social media. And so we have people who are really marketing their stuff like on Instagram or whatever. So how do you, and, and what I'm seeing is that test knitting has really changed too. And people's understanding of what test knitting is. It seems like test knitting is really a product of independent designing and it isn't something that you would have seen before. And that some people think that that's a substitute for tech editing. Yes. It's a question we get a lot. <laughs> we do. So I don't know, Christina, maybe you can jump in here, but t testing, I don't know the history of it. Like I do know what's happened in the sewist realm with independent sewing designers um, before the advent of uh, Ravelry. Um, but I think there's something that happened magically when the PDF patterns became available and purchasable with PDF downloads um, through Ravelry, mm -hmm. where you could also create a group and yeah. you could also create a lot of talk about your pattern before it even published. Um, and that's where the testing came in, like, hey, let's test, let's test this. And then testing became something of a marketing tool, yep. not actually a test of the pattern necessarily. Um, but maybe Christine can talk a little bit about the difference between testing and tech editing. Well, I think you're right that the test testing has become a little bit of a marketing tool, but, um, I think that, yeah, designers can often be like, oh, well, if I had, um, these, you know, knitters test my pattern, they knitted and it worked for them. And so, you know, they caught these mistakes while they were working through my pattern. And, um, it's just not the same, like a test knitter is knitting knitting the pattern and they are knitting one size of the pattern. Say if it's, even if it's like a hat, if it's in four sizes, they're knitting their size. Right. right. Um, even if it's not a garment and um, they're not like, it's a, like, it's a learned skill to tech edit a pattern. So they're, they're knitting it, which is a whole different experience and a whole different way of experiencing the pattern than reading through it and working through it line by line and mathematically in your brain right? Mm -hmm. It's a whole different experience. And when you're tech editing, you're not looking at one size and what your knitting experience is. You're looking at the entire pattern as a whole and how each part relates to the other part and how the sizes relate to each other and how that all works together. So it's a lot of things you're have to, having to um, take into account that a test editor never has to even think about. And um, so they're not going to be able to see or catch the things that you need a tech editor for that a tech editor is doing. It's a completely different process and a completely different way of working a pattern and experiencing a pattern. Like we're not sitting here knitting sweaters at the desk. Right. Um, you know, it and does seem like that some test knitters, well, and maybe some designers feel like, like, well, they're relying on the test knitters to catch the mistakes and the test knitters might you know, might feel like, well, you should rewrite it this way. Like they're, it's like, they think that that is their response as it just, I, I just seen that over time, like when I had an early pattern that I had tested, it was, I wanted test knitters to get pictures so that on the day it was released, people could see it. That, that was the purpose. 
And then it was years before I released another pattern. And then all of a sudden testimony was so different. And then now I look at it on Instagram. I'm like, it is even more different. There's like two camps related to testing. Uh, most testinators in our industry are not paid. And so this can be problematic. There's a lot of conversation around doing unpaid work um, for our industry. Like ha it's problematic. Yeah. Um, unpaid labor. The, the, but there are some, there are some designers who think if you've had this technically, if you've had your pattern technically edited by a trained technical editor who knows what they're doing, you don't need it test knit. Right. But I would argue there's a lot of things that can happen on the needles that when you're working through it in your head, line by line, or with a spreadsheet mathematically, you're not going to, it's not going to happen yeah. you because need, you're not physically working it. So yeah. there is a place for testing with, and we think it's, it's two things that can work in, in tandem together um, to create a great pattern, but there's a lot of problem issues around testing right now. I and think. do you think the test or uh, the tech editing should be done before the test knitting? Yes. Like the order. Yeah. If you want to get good information from your testers about their experience knitting the pattern and fit, which is a lot of what people mm. want to know about in um, a test knit is how do you, uh, how's it working for you? How does the, how did you feel you had to modify it? How's the fit? How does this work? What I changed over here, whatever. If you want them to give you good information and feedback about your pattern, you need to give them a good pattern. You can't give them a pattern that's a train wreck and a nightmare and all these problems in it and expect to get good information. They're not going to have a good, successful time working through the pattern for you. You know, so we totally do think that's a good idea to get it tech edited first. What aspects of producing a good pattern do you think the average knitter is unaware of in terms of the amount of labor and the number of people involved and just the overall cost to produce? a really good pattern. I think starting just with in the designers camp, how many, maybe hundreds of hours is put into the thought process from design idea to producing the actual written pattern. Um, even if they're creating the sample themselves or hiring a sample knitter, um, doing every aspect of sizing and of grading there, there is so much that goes into it even before it gets to our desk to be technical, to be edited. There and is producing a beautiful finished um, document that is what people want. I mean, there are so many roles and jobs that an independent designer has that is different than how it used to be. And they are playing a lot of roles and doing a lot of different jobs that all require different kinds of skill, right? Yes. And all those things are a cost and time. Um, and there's a lot, I think that people don't think about. There's a lot of training, right? Like if you wanna, you have to know, you, you know, you're not gonna be able to go, um, I can knit so I can design a sweater. There's a lot you have to learn to be able to design a sweater that's gonna fit multiple sizes as well. That's a lot of, that's a lot of knowledge. And I think people don't realize how much there is involved in doing just that. And, um, the and like you said, Roxanne, in the beginning, like writing the pattern, um, just getting from your head and from the design you have to translate that into words on paper that every knitter and size can make from, you know, it's like, even just like things like, oh, how can I make this line of instruction simpler? And, you know, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Pattern writing is a, is a, is a whole skill by itself. And yeah. then once it gets through technical editing and then testing, then it has to be marketed and, <laughs> and, and then you got to provide supported. customer service. There, there is a layout lot. chart creation, you know, yep. photos. I mean, if you want it to be appealing to, to, to knitters, they want lots of photos. They want to be able to see clearly what they're going to get. Um, lots of times it's designers will have it on multiple models. Um, you know, that's a lot. Do you think there's such a thing as a perfect pattern? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, Christine. I think there's such a thing as like a comprehensive or complete or, you know, like correct in those kinds of ways. But I don't think you can say there's a perfect pattern because there's like Sarah was saying, there's different audiences. Like there's yep. a lot of, not every knitter wants to knit every pattern. So 
you know, they're going to, there's, that's why I think it's so that, you know, one of the things, and maybe this is different from um, a, a, a tech editor point of view, or at least the, the view that Sarah and I hold that we try to talk about is different from maybe what a test editor is doing is it's not our pattern. We don't feel any kind of ownership over the pattern or any sort of right to make decisions about how it's going to be presented or what's going to be in it. So it really is, um, a, there's a different person for every pattern, there's a different person who's going to want to want to knit it. Um, I think the best pattern is one that clearly communicates the information to the maker where they don't have any problem reproducing what the designer intended. And they get and, what they were promised. And they get what they're promised. Is there perfect pattern? I don't know if that's possible, but definitely you can deliver on your promise because pe mm -hmm. people are paying you for this. Mm -hmm need to give them what they're paying for. Yeah. You know, that's something that's really important. You have to be careful that you are delivering on the promise you're giving because they are paying for it and investing a lot of time in knitting and a lot of, um, costs themselves to make it. And, um, if it doesn't come out and they follow your instructions faithfully, um, and they don't get what you said they were going to get, you know, it's not cool. Tell us what format so your book is going to be available and where people can get it and um, let them know if you are going to be doing book signings or anything like that where they might be able to find you our book, book is, is available <laughs> go ahead christina <laughs> the book is available as a hard copy you can pre-order it anywhere really um it's available like everywhere books are sold online and you can get it as an ebook also um we we're working on an audiobook version of it. Not sure when that will be produced or completed. Right, um, working on that. We are our book launch weekend is Rhinebeck this year at the New York Sheep and Wool Festival in Rhinebeck, New York. Uh, we will be at the Merritt Book Booth signing copies. You can come in and, and get a copy there in person. You can or pre-order it online from Merritt Book Booth, and they will have your copy there. Or if you've already pre-ordered, you can come see us in person and our publicity department has given us book plates and bookmarks to, so you can have something signed in the front of your book. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Christina and Sarah, for joining me here. I'm, I think it's a, a really important topic, even if everybody doesn't want to be a tech editor. I think it's really important as a knitter to understand what tech editors do and to appreciate that work that's so behind the scenes. So Thank you very much for joining me. You're very welcome. Thanks for having us, Roxanne. You Thanks for having us. Again, the book is The Knitting Pattern Writing Handbook by Sarah Walworth and Christina McGrath. I read a pre-release copy of the digital version of this book earlier this summer, and I really liked it. I'm looking forward to getting a hard copy version of it to put on my reference shelf. So I'll leave links down in the show notes for how you can order the book as well as a link to their website and YouTube channel. The official published date for the book is Tuesday, October 31st, but it's available for pre-order now and there's a discount code for 10% off pre-orders down in the show notes. And if you're going to Rhinebeck on the weekend of October 21st, they'll be there signing copies of their book. If you happen to see them, tell them I said hello. Some of you may know that I wrote technical knitting articles for various Interweave magazines for about five years, from 2017 up until just about a year ago. Regardless of how good I thought my article was when I submitted it, the published result was always better because it had gone through the project editor who had questions and made comments about changes that could make things clear. And then it went to a technical editor who made sure that my instructions were correct every time. The article was always better every time. One of the reasons I framed my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade within that time period of the 1890s to 1990s was because I wanted to focus on the printed published pattern. The rise of the internet in the late 1990s dramatically changed knitting, including how knitters learned to knit, how they shared their knitting knowledge, and how knitting patterns were published. Essentially, anyone can publish a pattern these days if they have access to the internet and can create a PDF. We have so many choices, but our choices are not all equal. A great design 
does not necessarily mean that the pattern to replicate it is well written, nor does it mean that it is mistake free in the instructions. So if you're buying a pattern from an independent designer, many of them will mention specifically on the pattern information page, like on Ravelry when you're looking at a pattern page before you buy it, there's a lot of information and they will mention on that page that their pattern has been tech edited. The lack of that information doesn't mean it wasn't tech edited and you're unlikely to see that mentioned on the pattern pages of commercially published patterns. But if you're looking at a pattern that doesn't have a lot of projects associated with, maybe you're not familiar with the designer, that could be one way to get that bit of assurance that this is a quality pattern. I really enjoyed talking to Sarah and Christina and I hope you enjoyed listening. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.